Hi, my name is Lena. Welcome to my channel and let's talk about uh, books I have been reading uh, in April 2020. So, uh, I have talked about uh, Letters of Pliny the Younger and about uh, one of the Amalia Peabody mystery books written by Eliz Elizabeth Peters in my previous video. Uh, and right now I'd like to talk about <laughs> book number nine in Amalia Peabody uh, mystery series written by Elizabeth Peters and it's seen a large cat. Uh, in this book, as always, as most of the times, the mystery happens in Egypt. So uh, Amalia Peabody and her husband, uh, Professor Emerson, and uh, her son, uh, who is nicknamed Ramses, and their ward, uh, Nefret, they are in Egypt. When they find an unknown tomb, tomb and an, a very strange mummy, not the kind they could have expected to find. And so there is a crime and Amalia, uh, as always, investigates it. But this time, uh, the children, Nefret, uh, Ramses, and uh, their friend, uh, David, they are 16, they are about 16 years old, and they uh, conduct their own investigations, and they have their own secrets. It's entertaining, I mean, it's very well written, it's endearing in places, it's funny. I think the book has a very good humor in it, very good dialogues. I especially like the relationships in the family uh, between Amalia and her, Amelia and her husband. I like their dialogues uh, and their relationships. It's very uh, entertaining, it's very likable. But this time we have two parties uh, that conduct investigations. So we have two points of view. Amalia's, uh, Amelia's point of view is uh, given us uh, through her diaries and her son's, uh, supposedly her son's point of view is given uh, to us through his attempt at writing a novel, something like that. So we have two points of views, and I'm not sure about that yet. It, it worked, sort of. <laughs> it's entertaining, it's interesting. Of course it's interesting to know Ramses' point of view. I'm not just used to these uh, two narrations in one mystery uh, by Elizabeth Peters. I really, I really enjoyed it, and it had a bit of romance, uh, not well defined romance. We have an old friends, a couple, our old friends, a couple, who have some marital problems, and we have some fences uh, among the younger generation and it was <laughs> interesting. Sorry guys for taking so long. I did enjoy, I did enjoy uh, this book. Then uh, unfortunately I am still at chapter 28 of Mr. Scarborough's Family by Anthony Trollope. I did enjoy it. Uh, this is scene of uh, proposal of Mr. Prosper's proposal to Mrs. Sorobbaum. It was the most delightful thing I have read uh, in in some time. It was funny. Uh, 
and the result of this thing was um, <laughs> very funny indeed. Uh, when this uh, Mr. Prosper was uh, afraid of being rejected uh, at some, and then he is accepted. And that's the main point of his unhappiness, uh, because he proposed to this very strong-minded uh, woman with her own ideas of how they are alive together, uh, of what their life together should be, and she accepted him. And he doesn't know how to go back on his proposal. It was so funny. Um, I really liked it. And I will continue reading it. Then I tried uh, to read Adrian the Restless Emperor by Anthony R. Burley. Sorry, guys, uh, those are my ebooks, and, and I'm not showing it to you. So I tried it, and I loved the introduction uh, because he was speaking of something that I had uh, some idea about. Uh, because I read Margaret Yesenar and her Memoirs of Adrian, so I knew a bit about Adrian himself and his life as an emperor and before that as a, a, an heir to Trojan, kind of, sort of. So I knew about that. But the next chapter is uh, the childhood in... Uh, Flavian Rome, and I have absolutely no background knowledge, and uh, so Mr. Burley lost me, but Lev Tolstoy found me, so I have finally finished the War and Peace, and I loved uh, every minute of it. Uh, so, many years back, I think it was 2018, when I read the first volume. Uh, my edition is in two volumes. Initially, Tolstoy meant it to be in four volumes. Uh, so, this uh, one book contains first and second volume of the book. And this one, the third and the fourth one. And the third and the fourth one, one volumes of the book I read this time. So, it can be roughly said that the first book is about peace uh, before Napoleon's invasion of Russia in 1812 um, and this one is the invasion of Russia by Napoleon in 1812 and this part is uh, war mostly and many years back uh, I think I was uh, raving about uh, Tolstoy's ability to write small supporting characters, uh, which he used, whom he used uh, in his world building to create some emotional moments for us. Uh, so, uh, and uh, how I loved these characters and how they were very well defined, uh, how he could, with a small extract of text, define them, gave them character, gave them soul, basically. To give them so so and I was raving about that and I was probably talking about uh, how Tolstoy loved even very flawed characters uh, you can feel his love for them but <laughs> uh, after this break I took I I saw a very different author maybe uh, because the tone of narration changed. I, I should have probably read the first uh, book before reading the second book. I reread the first book before reading the second, but I didn't do it. So I think the tone of narration changed quite a bit, but I'm not sure because the break was about two years. Uh, sorry about that. Then probably it had something to do with uh, the fact that I read uh, Throlop and Sakere, who do love their uh, flawed characters, but this time around Tolstoy seemed to me um, very brutal. 
especially in the way he described Napoleon and Alexander the First. Uh, he he cuts right to the bone. He has no love for these characters, and they are. Uh, it's like he despises them. Uh, I wouldn't like uh, to be described in such a way in uh, his book as he describes Napoleon and Alexander the First. We absolutely uh, unable to respect any of them, and. Uh, um, we cannot feel love for them whatsoever. This second part is very heavy on Tolstoy's philosophy of what is history, how should we study history, what is the part of an individual historical figure is ma in making history, what is uh, free will, is there such thing as free will, uh, what is power, is there such thing as absolute power? Uh, how are circumstances and conditions and will of some millions of people, how they are interconnected and so on and so forth. But nevertheless, this second part made the deepest impression on me. Here again, we have a lot of small supporting characters Tolstoy using to build the world for us, to build, to show us the war, and uh, of eighteen twelve, and there are a lot of funny moments and endearing moments, and uh, a lot of enraging and horrifying and ugly moments. And we follow three families three noble Russian families, the Balkonsky, uh, the Rostovs, and the Bezukhovs. We follow men through battles and hospitals and uh, captivity, and women through so-called peace, uh, when they have to leave their houses, leave all their possessions and uh, move first to Moscow, uh, then to Moscow region, then uh, to other cities, further from Moscow and uh, French army. I think the main inconvenience in reading this book is that it contains uh, big extracts of French text. But I think it's important. Uh, this text of course, is given right away in translation. But I think it's important because uh, we understand better who are these nobilities of Russian, who are these <laughs> noble-born uh, people who fight uh, Napoleon and his army along with the simple soldiers. They were used to admiring everything French, fashion, theater, literature, everything that comes from France were admired and mimicked and followed and adapted. So they were basically in love with everything French. To speak and to write in French as a Frenchman, as a Frenchman sorry, was a sign of a noble birth and of a good education. So, and these people who admired everything French, they still uh, left their houses in Moscow and they exiled themselves, just not to bow to Napoleon. Um, how people in different countries did. I don't think I understand this myself, I fully understand this myself, but I think it's important and that's why uh, <laughs> this new translation uh, of War and Peace probably uh, 
the translators made a right decision to preserve these French e extracts in their translation. So, <laughs> I really, I really enjoyed the second book. And I think I will reread both volumes this, this time, at some time in future, maybe soon. About my plans. Uh, I'd like to participate in uh, Molière May, uh, Fariba, from the Franca Fiorida, invites us to read five plays by Molière in 2020, in May 2020. And if you are interested, uh, you'd better hurry up and download uh, The Bourgeois Gentleman from Gutenberg Project. Be we have three days to read it. I think it should be enough. Fariba will have a discussion in uh, a live stream, I think, on the 3rd of May. I will leave a link to her channel uh, in the info box. It's a very good channel. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, this channel is unknown to you, but still, uh, she, she was quite busy with her studies. Uh, so I'll leave the link to her channel in the info box and if by some chance you don't know this channel you should definitely go and watch some videos and see for yourself. Uh, I think uh, you will like her channel. So I I want to participate in this. I want to read five plays by Marier and then I want to try again to read Hadrian, the Restless Emperor, and the next book in Amalia PPD, Mr. Isilius, the tenth book, The Ape Who Got the Balance, Who Got the Balance by Elizabeth Peters, because I think I need Amalia and uh, Professor Emerson in my life right now. Thank you for watching, goodbye, happy reading, uh, stay safe.